Hey, all right. So this is a video to walk you through the whole, like my whole process with filling out a spam square uh, to evaluate an argument, right? And to gather evidence in order to do some uh, written out rhetorical analysis. We're gonna be using Angela Lee Duckworth's TED Talk, uh, which we're gonna be watching in class, but I think we're gonna run out of time on doing the whole spam square. So I wanna provide this resource for everybody to use on their asynchronous day after our first class. So here's the deal. First things first, I'm gonna set myself up for success. I'm gonna make a copy. So I'm gonna say spam square plus, I'm gonna do spam square Duckworth grit TED talk. All right, so I've got that all ready to go for myself. That way I'm not <coughs> messing up my original document. And then I can see I've got uh, the sample here. Here's the great thing. Um, it's a TED Talk. And TED Talks are always directed um, toward a worldwide audience. So you know what I'm going to do, which is totally fine, because I would love you to work smarter and not harder. I'm going to copy and paste this because I would say exactly the same thing. This talk has, I don't know how many views. I'm going to go look. Let's see. How many views does it have? Over 23 million views. That's kind of why I picked it. A lot of people have, have uh, watched this one and a lot of people have different things to say about it, both positive and negative. And I think it's uh, really interesting to um, engage in, in uh, you know, a conversation, a dialogue that's happening with people all over the world from different backgrounds who either really agree with this talk and the things that she says, or like really strongly disagree. And that's fine, right? As long as we base our disagreement um, in reasonable evidence that we find in the talk. All right, let's see what year this is, 2013. Now, this is all to say, you're noticing that there's a lot of things that I can, there are certain things that I can fill out without um, even having watched the talk. So this is a way to set myself up for success is have certain things done before I even start. Grit, the power of passion and perseverance. I'm just gonna like, I don't know, remember that. Grit, the power of passion and perseverance. All right, we can see I put it in quotes because it's a, it's a speech, it's a talk. The location is, you can find this all in the details, right? Like not, I'm not saying that generally speaking, but in every TED Talk, if you look at details, you can see TED Talks Education, April, April 2013. So let's see, text title, got it. Location, um, we're just gonna say online. Good enough, right? It doesn't give any specific location, so it's online, fine. It goes to the whole world. And then for this part, I'm gonna fill this in. You might notice I'm using the highlighter. It just makes things look cleaner to me so I can tell what is the handout and what is my work. You know what I'm saying? Today is the 15th of April. I am doing this before class even happens. Cool, so we've got that. Oh, and then let me copy and paste Check it out. Actually, I'm just going to do it straight up like that. I should have done that the first time. And I'm going to leave that sample available to me for now, just because um, it makes me feel better to be able to look back and see uh, kind of what I did before. However, let me say that this one is like mad detailed filled out and you do not have to do that. I don't expect this level of detail from from all y'all's work. I just wanted to make the sample as detailed as possible, right? Um, so you could write like many different paragraphs off of this. You could write a whole essay off of the evidence that I have here. Cause like, check it out. There's evidence here about audience. This is a piece of evidence. I got a piece of evidence here. 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 And I got a piece of evidence here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of evidence. That's like already practically enough 
for an essay. Um, but all of this to say, when you sit down to write your rhetorical analysis paragraph from either this spam square that I'm about to fill in uh, with you, or with one from a TED talk that that you choose that 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 seems like a more relevant and interesting topic to you, um, you're going to want to be strategic, right? Like you don't have to talk about all these things because um, for a really nice body paragraph, you don't you need like max three pieces of uh, specific like direct text evidence, three pieces. So that means that like, it doesn't need to be all of it. But I do want you to find at least one piece of evidence for for these categories of ethos, pathos and logos. And for the main claim, because um, that's going to deepen your understanding as we're continuing to really internalize these rhetorical appeals. By that, I mean, that it's not something where like you're like ethos what is that again what is what is that let me look in my dictionary let me look in quizlet when something's internalized it's it's become like a part of you it's like a part of your mind and you don't even have to like think to to know it and you just find it really easily so this is not just to help you with like this one little paragraph but this is really an exercise in internalizing these different categories of rhetorical appeals so that you can carry that like skill and that um, whole different way of approaching the text or, or of listening to and analyzing and evaluating a speech. You can carry that with you for the rest of your life, okay? So let's do it. I think I've got everything I need, right? Everything else I'm gonna need to, oh, okay, speaker. Check it out. We know stuff about her here. So you know what I'm going to do? Let's work smarter, not harder. According to the details from the TED Talk. Fine. Good. Is that like the perfect evidence lead in? No, but it doesn't matter because like we're, we're collecting stuff. Okay. So there we go. Now we know things about her and we've put the information that the website thinks is most important to know about this speaker. She used to be in a fancy job, then she taught math and then hmm, her theory of grit as a predictor of success. This is like other stuff that, fine. You know what? We're gonna leave it like this. We're gonna leave it like this um she is now a psychologist because it mentioned that like somewhere on the website i think this is going to make it too big there we go that looks nice huh all right so now let's uh start viewing the talk and see what's next so we're all set up before the talk has even like i've even started playing it we can fill in the top we can fill in information about the speaker just based on like the lovely details that we can we can pull right from the website. And then for audience, if it's a TED Talk, please feel free to just copy and paste uh, from the sample because it's it's always like a very um, non-specific audience, I guess you could say. And I'm going to make this smaller. It's bothering me that that's not fitting on the page. Sorry. Okay, whatever, it's there. So now let's watch it. When I was 27 years old, I left a very demanding job in management consulting for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests. I gave out homework assignments. What is she doing when the right work now? Came back. I calculated grades. Blah blah blah. She's talking what about teaching. What struck me was that IQ. Okay, hold up. So what I'm hearing is right away she is appealing to ethos. First sentence right out of her mouth is when I was 27, I left a very demanding job. Blah blah blah. More demanding teaching. I taught. I calculated grades. So that's already an appeal to ethos. 
So I'm going to say, oh, and I'm going to make it green because I like it. Appeal to the ethos in very first sentence. See, and see, like we're talking about, like, oh, how does she establish like credibility or authority? She establishes her, um, she establishes that she has multiple kinds of work experience. First in, uh, first, okay. Now I just want to put evidence. Um, very demanding job management consulting. First in demanding management job and as she puts it, that's like how I'm kind of signaling that I'm just going to use evidence now. A job that was even more demanding, teaching. For a job that was even more demanding, teaching. Cool. Let's put that in. All right, so we've got one piece of evidence about how she's establishing her credibility already, right off the bat. That's pretty cool. Now, um, I could keep adding stuff for ethos if that's what I want to focus on, but I might not know that yet. Um, I might need to just like listen to the whole thing, kind of write some things down, um, and then decide like, hmm, I want to focus on how this speaker appeals to ethos. But maybe that's not it. Like maybe I want to focus on pathos or logos. Like if I find that there's like a strong emotional appeal. So it just depends. Like you do not have to fill out all these sections with like the same like giantness. Um, it just it depends on like what you want to write on and what you want to focus your analysis on. All right. So let's listen on. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests. I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. All right. <laughs> Real talk, I have a problem with this claim uh, to a certain extent. The one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. According to who? According to what? There is no, she's not supporting that with evidence at all. Like, and from my prior knowledge, I can tell you that IQ tests also were partly developed like during a time of uh, Jim Crow systemic racist policies. They have been used to oppress and to marginalize people. So do we really know how to measure IQ best? That's really questionable. And she gives no, um, she gives no support for that. So I want to add that to logos, but to say that that's a flaw. All right, to persuade through logical thinking. But I'm going to keep hearing her out. What if doing well in school depends on more than that? And yada yada. Um,
but you can collect evidence here that's compelling or you can you can also collect evidence that especially like in this logo section or this pathos section that you feel is potentially problematic um all right i need to find where she said that so that i can um cite this correctly in this case like i'm just saying she said this at the very beginning so i i don't feel it and i already have established who is saying it so i don't feel that it's really um necessary in this evidence collector to put a parenthetical citation but in this case i will 108 now if you're wondering like why is Ms. right putting 108 right there um that's because if something is a speech uh something that's like a speech a, a film a tv show something where there's like it's going for a certain amount of time we obviously can't put a page number, right? Because there's no pages. It's it's being shared out loud. So um, then, like that timestamp is the closest thing that we have a page to a page number. Because then, if somebody was like really interested in our work and wanting to to kind of like check on us, like if they were if you were going to encounter like a skeptical reader, they can look at that and say, "Oh, at 108, at 108, really." Is that true? You'd be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, there it is. It's right there." Okay, so that's it's adding to the credibility of the evidence that you are putting in. So this is actually um, problematic. Or now I'm gonna say like Duckworth makes this claim without any supporting evidence. Many people. Uh, there's uh, I'm, like what I'm wanting to say is that there's a lot of research that indicates that IQ testing and standardized testing um, is sometimes like racially inequitable, um, and 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 that it doesn't always successfully measure students' intelligence or students' ability because it's just like this one test that that everybody gets and that's like not fair it's not always an accurate measurement um so i'm just gonna say like research that suggests um the problematic nature <laughs> problematic nature of standardized testing counts all right there you go um why am i bothering to write all this right now because it's going to make it like so fast and so easy to make a paragraph out of this and like yeah so i'm putting a, a lot more time into this spam square because it's going to make writing a paragraph super super snappy all right let's keep watching but what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily <sighs> So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I'm going to add that really quick ethos. Later on, she adds uh, to her expertise, um, explaining that she why do I use so many direct quotes? <laughs> because then I don't have to paraphrase as much. Okay. Went to graduate school to become a psychologist. Studying kids and adults. Okay. Explaining that she has since left teaching. Um, studied psychology and um, conducted research with people of all ages. So that's like strong ethos, right? Like, yes, she was a teacher, so she knows about teaching and learning because of that. She also was just this kind of like smart person with this fancy management job, right? And then now she's a psychology researcher and she's researched like related to motivation and success and blah, blah, blah on this topic that she's giving a talk on with both kids and adults.
So like in terms of her appeal to like multiple audiences, she's saying like, I know stuff about every kind of person. I am an expert. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still gonna be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is gonna keep their jobs? And who's gonna earn the most money? And all those- So that's all more ethos right there. If you wanted to focus on ethos, I would just like add that to the ethos section because she's giving like specific evidence of all these different groups that she has studied. Very different contexts. One characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Okay, so now she's defining her claim. Like her claim is grit is a thing that everybody needs to be successful more than like intelligence, more than social IQ. You need to have grit. And then you're like, what's grit? She's like, I'll tell you, grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. All right, that's the main claim. She's already, she's throwing it out there. And now like, we're gonna wait and we're gonna hear if you know we believe her or not, and she's gonna make her argument. So grit, which Duckworth defines as, how does she define it? Isn't this so great that it like highlights this for you? <laughs> Passion and perseverance for very long time goals. Passion and perseverance for very long term goals. So not like little goals, like very long term. Meaning like being in eighth grade and then like having passion and perseverance for a very long term goal of um, getting a graduate degree, not just graduating from um, getting your bachelor's, but like my very long term goal is to become uh, a, um, an immigration lawyer to help people, right? That kind of thing. Grit. She's saying out of everything else, you need grit to achieve that kind of very long term goal. Okay, so what is it? The main claim grit um, is um, the most important factor for success in school, work, and life. There we go. And I already included a direct quote. This section, done. I'm gonna like look at this for a second to be like, hmm, understanding of Kairos. This was in 2013, so I don't know. I don't really know, like, this doesn't feel like, like it feels just as timely now. Um, so I don't know what I think about that, but I, I'm hoping that I have a thought about that at the end, okay? So right now, like, as I'm listening to the talk, I'm gonna go like this. And to be honest, if I get to the end of the talk and I still don't really have something to say for that, I'm gonna take my two question marks and then I'm gonna say like, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how this talk is timely. And you know what, if you write that, I'm cool with it. Just don't leave it blank. Like, but this tells me that you thought about it. Like, even if you didn't have an answer, you could be like, I thought about it, but I don't have an answer. Fine, okay? All right, let's keep going because we need to find perhaps more logos. I kind of like want to be argumentative with this paragraph in my mind. I want to I want to pick apart her argument um, because I think people need other things besides grit to be successful, like food and 
and love and safety and whatnot. And you can have all the grit in the world, but I don't think that that makes up for those things. So I want to look for logical fallacies, like places where there's like a little weakness in our argument. That's what I want to write on. So let's see. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living. Hey, side note, just as you're watching TED Talks on your own, if you feel like it's going too fast, you can slow it down. And if you're feeling impatient, you can speed it up. Just so you know. Life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters. It's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping out. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. What the heck? She didn't even know? That makes me mad. But we'll keep watching. I don't know. Okay, so uh, let's think about where we can put this in the spam square because I think that's kind of interesting, right? The shocking thing about gray is we don't know very much about gray. And then every day parents and teachers ask her these things and she's like, I don't know. What's that about? She doesn't know how, but she just knows you need it. What good is that? All right. I'm going to say, I'm going to, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to prepare my, um, my parenthetical citation here. Four minutes in. Okay. Um, while she argues that grit is extremely important, and something she's conducted extensive research on. She doesn't actually have any evidence of how to teach or inspire grit people. Okay, like, that, that's kind of a problem. I'm just throwing that out there. All right. What I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. All right, let's keep going. What I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building, in fact, gonna, in our I data, listen to that again. grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. Okay, it said according to our data, and so like that, triggers me to think, okay, like this is part of the logical argument. Um, so that's something that's that's a positive. Um, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely, inverse like mathematical, like you're thinking like inverse operations, opposite related to measures of talent. So it's almost like the more talented someone is, the less grit they have. And the less talented someone is, the more grit they may have. 
So somebody who naturally finds math really hard would potentially have more grit when it comes to that than somebody who just thinks math is easy and gets things right away. Mm, do I want to add it to this though? Nah, I don't really need to. And does this appeal to emotions? Not really. Let's keep going. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. All right, so she brought up some more research. I would say um, bring up research um, that indicates an inverse relationship between grit and talent. When did that happen? Let me check in case I wanted to go back. Oh, 423. Why am I putting the timestamp? Because this is still evidence, even if it's paraphrased. It's not quoted, but this is not my idea, right? That's that's Duckworth's idea, the speaker's idea. So that's why I'm, I'm still citing it. Um, albeit paraphrased. All right, and then also, um, as well as Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset. Still no pathos. And that's where I'm gonna end my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful, and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. I guess that's emotion right there. Like, her ending is basically that they don't, she doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's not a strong, no, no strong appeal to pathos. We need help. Is that what she said? I'm going to look again. That's why the transcript's so great. Uh, we need more. I don't know. Like pathos, right? Is about emotions. Did this make me scared? No. Did this make me happy? No. Did it make me sad? No. Did it make me angry? I, I like am hearing the ideas and she's basically sharing this idea, this theory that she has um, for which she does not have any solutions. Um, and But there's not really any emotional component to it. Um, this talk was all about sharing ideas and some research. So strong emotions here. Okay. And that's fine. That's fine to say. Perhaps um, a person could argue that this talk is less persuasive because there is no sense of pathos, right? You don't feel like, oh, I'm angry. I need to help with grit or like, yes, I feel so excited, right? Um, feelings really motivate our, um, our actions. And given that there are not really any strong feelings indicated here, um, that means like, I'm just gonna listen to it and I'm gonna move on, right? Um, Kairos, uh, there is no strong, there is no apparent connection between this talk and the particular context. And it's just kind of like, it could have been given this year. Could have been given 
um, you know, other years ago. Ooh, I'm all over the place now, right? There's, it's just whenever. It's whatever. All right. I'm just coloring that. So we're good there. And now purpose. What is the speaker's goal? That's connected again to like the main claim. So um, Duckworth's goal is to share her theory, I guess you could say, that grit is essential for success in school and life. Okay. Um, how do they reveal it? I'm just going to use this again. Cool. So to share her theory. And then like, again, if I'm thinking in terms of mm, mm, these examples that I have um, listed here, like to inform is to inform the audience of her theory. Share supporting research and persuade others to conduct more research on how we can, how we might teach grit, right? Because that's what she said at the end. I'll use a piece of evidence to prove that. It said like, we need more. That's where I'm going to end my remarks. That's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas and we need to test them. conclusion, she appeals to the audience to do more. And it's right at the end, 520. Okay. There we have it. That is all of it. And now that I've gotten everything I need, I'm going to delete the sample. Cool. That's my finished spam square for Angela Duckworth's 2013 TED Talk, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. So then I'll go ahead and use this and then uh, make a paragraph of rhetorical analysis. I hope you find this helpful. Uh, remember, we can be strategic. There are a lot of areas like the speaker, this whole top area, and the audience that you can fill out before you even start, uh, before you even hit play on the TED Talk. And then for here, you feel free to not be sure about some things, um, but just indicate that you did try and that, that you thought through it and that you have a fair amount of evidence, enough evidence uh, to write a paragraph. Okay? All right.